we're glad you're here this morning. We have uh, some special guests uh, with us today, Mike and Kathy Tess from Bozeman, Montana. Mike and Kathy are the parents of Joe Tess and uh, Melanie Welch, um, which they have seven grandkids that attend services here, so they kind of feel like they have an investment in this congregation. Uh, but we're glad that Tracy finally decided to come to Bible class. It took her father-in-law teaching, but to get her out to class, we're... Okay, Tracy, I'll leave you alone now. So before we start, are there prayer requests? I'm going to introduce Mike here in a minute. Uh, are there prayer requests? We need to remember Sid Watson and the death of his sister and... Uh, Darlene Farrar, uh, her husband's funeral was yesterday. I uh, visited with Mary Van Oy yesterday via text. Archie had his bypass surgery yesterday morning. It was supposed to take four hours. And when they got, <clears throat> when they got in there, they found a leaky valve and a, uh, an aorta that was needed repair. And it, it took seven hours to do the surgery. So we need to remember Archie and Mary in our prayers. And uh, so let's, uh, let's pray together. Uh, Mel. Yeah, right. Okay. Thank you, Mel. I, I appreciate it. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for you giving your son so that we can have eternal life. Father, uh, we ponder that sometimes, and it, at times it seems so distant. Uh, but this week we, we put to rest uh, four precious souls that makes it reality. And Father, we pray you would bless those families that have lost loved ones. Father, we would ask that uh, you would be with Archie and uh, he would continue to heal from his surgery and that uh, this bypass would work and he can get on dialysis and his life and health would be much better. And Father, we pray that you would be with Mary and the grandkids and the kids as they take care of him. And Father, we pray your blessings of comfort and peace for them. And Father, uh, we pray that you'd be with Sid and uh, Thelda and, and the death of Sid's sister. And we pray for comfort for them. Father, we would ask that uh, you would be with the families and the victims of uh, the devastation of the tornadoes in Kentucky and Tennessee and in that part of the country. And Father, we uh, just ask that we as a, a church body would reach out, and Father, we are we're very good about giving things. But Father, we pray you'd put the right people that would give of themselves for comfort and for help during this trying time. Father, we're thankful that Mike and Kathy are here, and uh, Father, we're thankful for the work that they do in Bozeman, for the ministry and the shepherding that they do. And Father, we just pray you'd be with Mike today that. Uh, he would be able to to say the things and uh, illustrate the things that you have put on his heart. And Father, we're thankful for their service in the church. And please be with us as we study and forgive us our sins in Christ's name. Amen. A little bit, uh, first of all, I want to thank Gene for giving up this morning's class time. Uh, Gene was asked to do, asked to do a study on a, a walk through the Bible. That's a 15-week series, and uh, he's had to condense that, and he has, only has one more class, which will be next week. We will not assemble for Bible class on the 26th. And on January 2nd, uh, just a little bit of an introduction, I'm going to come back in the auditorium, so I'm giving you fair warning if you want to find another class, be looking at the schedule. And I totally understand, but I, I'm toying around with the topic. There's a scripture in the Bible. Matter of fact, it's talked about three different times about uh, everything you do, do it with love 
or do it as if you're acting for God. That's a poor paraphrase, but that's what it's talking about. And I'm going to take that passage. I want to ask you a question that I want you to think about, and then I'd like for you, and, and sometime or another, I'm going to ask you to write something on one of those white cards. And in light of that scripture, doing everything, you, when you do it, do it as if you're working for the Lord. I want you to put a quotation in there, but sometimes I just don't feel like it. And then I want you to fill in the blank. We're going to take those comments and go to scripture and work on an idea of how do we convince ourselves it's not about feeling, it's about a way of life. And that's what I am, I'm excited that Mike is here. Uh, I uh, asked Mike for a bio. He was hesitant to give it. And I'm, so I thought, well, you know how to get on Google. And I Googled his name and sure enough, it popped up. And there's several pages about Dr. Mike Tess and his work in the cattle industry. And uh, he is, uh, and so that you're not dealing with just a common ordinary Joe. Joe, that's not for you, that's for me. I want you to understand that uh, this Mike is quite educated. He has a bachelor's from Cal Poly in 1971 in animal science, a master's from Montana State University in 1978 in animal science, a PhD in the, from the University of Nebraska in animal science in 1981, he taught from 1981 to 1987 at North Carolina State University, and then 1988 to 2009, uh, he taught at the Montana State University, and from 2002 to 2005, he, the, he was the department head. So he has great credentials, and now I, I, he did send me a little bit of a bio. Mike and Kathy Tess both grew up on farms, and Mike was in California and Kathy in Texas. They met in Montana where Kathy's family had moved and where Mike was going to school, and after a three-month courtship, they married in Missoula, Montana on December 20th, and so they'll have a 50-second wedding anniversary coming up in just a few days. The Lord has blessed them with two sons and two daughters, two son-in-laws and two daughter-in-laws and 15 precious grandchildren seven of which live right here in Yukon, and they have worshiped and served in the church families in Montana, California, Nebraska, and North Carolina. With Kathy, it is invaluable, as Kathy, as his invaluable partner, Mike has served as a shepherd in the Bozeman Church in Montana for over 31 years. The reason I tell you all that, Mike had an occupation. He is now retired. He does a lot of consulting work for ranchers all over Montana and Wyoming. But Mike's spiritual life is not an occupation. It's a way of life. And that's what he's going to talk to us this morning about, about spiritual parenting. Mike, if you would come up. Uh, I think you have a mic, and I'll turn this one on. That ain't better. Okay. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, I'd like for you to think for a few minutes about what it means to be a parent. I don't want to. Uh, <clears throat> I want want you to to share what are some of the the fundamental things that parents do for their children. I don't mean take them to.
how to treat their mothers. Discipline. What about, uh, what about dreams? Do parents have dreams for their children? Sometimes they live their dreams through their children, Jean says. What are the most important thing, dreams that parents can have for their children? That they love the Lord and, and, and live for Him. Did I miss one? Wind up in heaven, yeah. So I'd like to share with you uh, a story that uh, from the book of Second Chronicles. We're going to be looking in chapters 22 through 24. That's a lot of material. We can't read it all, so I'm hopefully hopeful you're familiar with some of it. I'll try to uh, give you an abbreviated view of, of much of it. But this is in the period of the divided kingdom, where there was a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, all the kings of Israel were referred to as wicked in the Old Testament. Not one of them was commended as being good. And a few of the kings of Judah were commended as being good, but uh, many of them uh, were not. And so we're not going to go through all those kings, but I just need to, sh to be familiar with, with, with a few of them because they're relevant to the, the story. Names are a problem in the Old Testament, no matter which translation you use. Uh, they're difficult to pronounce. Uh, the spellings are not, not the same. Sometimes the spellings are not even the same within the same translation. Uh, at the beginning of a chapter, the king's name might be one thing, and at the end it might be something else. Uh, uh, some of the names are duplicated. The different people have the exact same name, and they don't live that many uh, years apart from one another. And so it's difficult to keep track of all that. And uh, like I said, they're difficult to, to say. So if I say them differently than the way you do in Oklahoma, please forgive me. So if you look at this little graph up there in the front, I, I made the font as big as I could, but it's still you're sitting so far away from it, it's hard to see, I guess. Uh, if you look at down on the, on the left-hand side of that, you'll see King Ahab. King Ahab... Uh, was one of the most wicked kings in all of Israel. It's famous for ha having a, a wife of nearly equal evil, Jezebel. And uh, she was the daughter of the king of Sidon and brought with her the worship of Baal. And uh, if you remember the story of Elijah, there's a lot about Baal worship in there. Ahab was succeeded by two sons. Uh, Ahaziah reigned briefly, and then when he died, he was, he was replaced by his brother Joram. Uh, and again, your translation may have different, different ways of, of saying uh, those things. Um, uh, both of the, uh, Jehu was the, the next king of Israel and came from a different family, and when he, he became king, he proceeded to kill all of Ahab's family, including Joram. Jehoshaphat was a contemporary of Ahab's, but he was the king of Judah. He was generally regarded as a good king, um, and he tried hard to follow the Lord. And there's some very good stories about Jehoshaphat in the, in the Bible. Uh, uh, but he had one weakness, and that was he continued uh, to want to be friends with Israel. The, the northern kingdom. And I guess that's understandable. You know, they, they shared common roots. Uh, but the Lord wasn't pleased with many of those things. And one of the most serious pro mistakes he made was to tie himself by marriage to the nation of Israel. He, his son, Jehoram, married Athaliah, who was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Um, anyway... Jehoram, the, the son that came from that, uh, became uh, the next king of, of, uh, of Judah. And he was 
a very wicked king in contrast to his father. And the Bible says in a couple places that he followed the advice of his mother, Athali uh, his wife, Athaliah, who was the daughter of Ahab. And uh, according to Elijah's prophecy, he uh, developed, uh, developed a very serious disease of the bowels and, and died of that. And uh, in 2 Chronicles 21, it makes, the author makes a very interesting commentary about Jehoram. It says, and he passed away to no one's regret and was buried in the, in the city of David. What a way to live, huh? Ahaziah was the next king of, of Judah. And uh, so he's underneath Jehoram on that little map I've got up there. And he was the daughter, or the son of Athaliah. So Jehoram and Athaliah's uh, son was Ahaziah, and he was uh, king of Judah. And he reigned for only a brief period. He was a wicked king. He only lasted a year. In fact, uh, when Jehu slaughtered the house of Ahab in Israel, he managed to catch Ahaziah and kill him at the same time. So we'll see if this, I don't know where to point this thing. There. So the characters of the story I want you to focus about in, in chapters 22 through 24 are, are listed up there. Joash, he's a, little, he's a, he's a baby when the story begins. He is uh, the youngest child of, of Ahaziah, uh, and his grandmother is uh, Athaliah. Uh, Athaliah, we've mentioned her before, is the paternal grandmother of this baby, Joash. She was the mother of King Ahaziah, who just, just uh, passed away, and the daughter of, of King Ahab from Israel. So they're all kind of interrelated. And she was a worshiper of Baal, much like her mother and, and father. Jehoshaphat is, is a lady that was actually a, a half-sister to, to Jehoram. Okay? So she was a half-sister to uh, Jehoram, but probably not the daughter of, of uh, Athaliah, like... like uh, and so she was a sister to Ahaziah, rather, a daughter of Jehoram, and, uh, but not probably the daughter of Athaliah. She was married to a chief priest, the Bible says, called Jehoiada. And he was a leading priest in Judah. The Bible does not use the word high priest on this man, but he was a, a man of, of considerable influence. And they had a son, at least one child that's mentioned in Scripture, and his name was Zechariah. So let's, let's read a little bit. I would like a volunteer to read from 2 Chronicles 22, uh, 10 through 12. 2 Chronicles 22, 10 through 12. And the setting of the story is, is that this King Ahaziah, uh, from the, the previous slide, King Ahaziah on the right, he has just passed away. Go ahead, Joe. Okay, so what, what do you think of Athaliah as a grandmother? How many grandmothers do you know would have their grandchildren killed so she could have what she wanted? Can you imagine? Huh? She had all of her sons 
sons, her grand, grandchildren, uh, assassinated so she could be queen of Judah. And, uh, and as Joe read, this lady by the name of Jehosheba, who was uh, an, an aunt to these, these boys, saved the youngest one. What do you think of Jehoshaphat? Hey. Took some courage to do that. Did you notice where she hid the baby? In the temple. That tells you a little bit about the spiritual state of Judah at that time. If you could hide from the queen in the temple, right? Right, yeah. So that, that gives you some indication of what was going on in, 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 in the country, I, I think. In chapter 23, um, the Bible des describes uh, how Jehoiada, Jehoshaphat's husband, who was the priest, how he arranged for uh, the, the child Joash to become king. And that was important because Joash at that time was the only surviving heir to the throne of David. He was the only child that was in the line of David that God had promised David that he would have a, a son on the throne. And so Jeho Joash was the only child that, that could fill that uh, role. He'd been uh, hidden and cared for by Jehoshaphat and Jehoiada and their family for six years. Now he was a seven-year-old boy. Uh, Jehoiada went to the military commanders around the country and the Levites and the heads of the Israelite families and he uh, got them to agree that they would assemble at the temple. They would surround the temple grounds. Uh, they would bring out the, the child Joash. They would put a crown on him and say, long live the, the king. And they, they armed the military with uh, weapons and, and he instructed them that anyone that would come in try to break into that ceremony would have to die. Well, when uh, they, they did all that and, and the shouts and, and rejoicing of having a son, a descendant of David on the throne again was such a, uh, a, a big deal that uh, Queen Athaliah heard about it. She heard the noise, rushed to the temple and uh, accused them of treason. They arrested her, took her outside the temple grounds and killed Athaliah. Uh, notice verse 11 in chapter 23. It says, Jehoiada and his sons brought out the king's son and put the crown on him, and they presented him with a copy of the covenant and proclaimed him king. And then they anointed him and shouted, Long live the king. And then down, skip down to verse 16, and it says, Jehoiada then made a covenant that he, the people, and the king would be the Lord's people. And all the people went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. What does this story say about the character and influence of Jehoiada, the, the chief by the name of Jehoiada? Any other thoughts? What do you think of Jehoiada? You think it took some courage to do what he did? One man made a difference. Yeah, we ought to remember that comment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's skip forward a little bit. We'll go down to chapter 24, and I want to read uh, verses 15 through 22. In the meantime, the, the Bible describes the, some of the rule of, of Joash. Some of this is also recorded in the book of 2 Kings. Uh, he was generally a, a good king, especially at the beginning of his rule. He, re, he restored the temple worship under the leadership of Jehoiada and 
and actually had some repairs done on the temple. Um, but then let's, let's pick up uh, uh, verse 15 through 22. So I need someone, if they will, to, to read that for us. Gene, you want to do that? I think verses 15 and 16 are pretty profound when it says Jehoiada was old and full of years and he died at 130 and he was buried with the, in the, with the kings. He was buried with the kings in the city of David because of the good he had done in Israel for God and his temple. Uh, Joash, the little king? No, he, 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 he is, well, he's her grandson. Jehoiada is, no, he's a Levite. He's a priest. He's not called the high priest like Caiaphas or something like that in the New Testament is called a high priest. He's not necessarily of the lineage of Aaron, but he's a priest. Um... I, I couldn't find any other things about that. So think about the relationship between Jehoiada, his wife Jehosheba, and this little boy Joash. How would you describe that relationship from what, what we've just read this morning? Adopted parents, you know? Any, any other... So if you, if you look to verse 2, look at verse 2. Uh, of <clears throat> of 20, 24. It says, Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehoiada the priest. That's what Gene was pointing out. That's one of the most profound verses in all the Old Testament. You just think about that, what that means. Jeho Joash did what was right all the years that Jehoiada was alive. So considering what we read about Joash after Jehoiada died, what, is it, what strikes you about this statement? He didn't learn a lot, huh? Anything else? What? Yeah. All right. Kathy said it had not made the faith his own. Mm-hmm. 
So what do you think about Jehoshaba and Jehoiada? Was their ministry a success? I think the, the writer of First Second Chronicles thought it was, the way he describes it, you know. Yeah. You know, my parents invested a lot into me. But at some point, it's my responsibility, right? At some point, it's mine. So I'd like to consider that, that this is an example of, of two people that were spiritual parents. They weren't Joash's biological parents. They were adoptive parents or foster parents or some other uh, like that. We have a lot of people in this country that are raising children that are not their own. Grandparents and grandmas and uncles and aunts and things like that. But, um, and, and there was some blood relation there, at least on Jehoshaphat's side. But maybe more importantly, for the nation of Israel, for the, the story of the Bible, this is, uh, they were spiritual parents. I think they are tremendous examples of faithfulness and courage and sacrifice uh, because if their plans hadn't worked, uh, they'd have surely died. There are another, I think what's neat about them is they worked as a team. They worked as a team. They're, not, they're, they're mentioned only together. They're not separate. Joash, unfortunately, is a, is a poignant example of spiritual failure. Um, and I think he begs the question for all of us is what will we do, or what will you do when your spiritual parent is gone? All of us have had people that have influenced us spiritually. Some of them might be our own physical parents, but many times they're they're people that uh, that are just other disciples that have invested in us in some way that have helped us uh, along the way. I can think of all the churches that Kathy and I have worshipped in. There's people in each of those congregations that have somehow helped Mike in some way. Um, Maybe your mentor's already gone. What will happen when, when your mentor's gone? Many of you in here are, are my age or my generation. You, I see quite a bit of gray hair in here, so I imagine many of your grandparents. Um, uh, think about, are you a spiritual parent? I think that's something that we all need to think about. Is our faith really our own or is it something that, that we borrowed or, or developed from the influence of somebody else but really never owned ourselves? Fifteen, ten, five years from now, twenty years from now, we'll, what will be the, the status of your faith? Will, will you be known as a spiritual parent when you die? Will you be someone who has trained and led and guided younger disciples to grow and mature and reproduce? Fifteen years from now, will you still be a committed disciple, a growing disciple, or will you be just an attender?
right? I agree with you. Yeah. I'd like to get, you consider that 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 the Bible wants the, the Lord wants me to be a spiritual parent, but not just to my own physical family. The Bible wants each of you to be a spiritual parent and not just to your own physical family. I'm absolutely convinced from my own life experience that the Lord puts people in your life every year, maybe even every week, for you to love and care for. He puts people in your life that you may not ha have a, a clue how to do it, he puts people in your life that he expects you to have a good influence on. I think we're all a little bit like John the Baptist. You know, John was supposed to make straight the path to the Lord, right? I think my job is to, for every person that I'm involved with, to make their path to Jesus a little smoother than it was. Um, Paul's a great example of a spiritual parent in the New Testament. He refers to Titus and Timothy as his true sons in the faith. Um, he thought of them as his sons. Paul wasn't even married. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he's He's writing to a church that's a, a little, you know, that he's a little bit frustrated with. He's disappointed in how they've reacted. They're kind of div divided and, and they're critical of him. And in chapter four, he says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you did not have many fathers for in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. And then what he says next is just um, really profound. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. He described his relationship when he ministered to the church in Thessalonica for a brief time in writing that first letter back to them in chapter 2. He says, um, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, we cared for, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. A couple of verses down, he says, You know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging and comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God. I guess if you don't remember anything about what I've said this morning, I'd like you to remember this, that, that I really firmly believe the church needs more disciples who are willing to act and be, be spiritual parents. And that's a title that's not related to whether you're married or how old you are. It has nothing to do with either of those things. We need, the church needs more disciples who who really want to grow up and mature. More disciples who are really, who really want to help other people grow. And we need more disciples who are willing and expectant to be imitated. That, you think about that. We need disciples who are willing to be imitated. We need more disciples who are willing to invest in the lives of others, like Jehoshaphat and Jehoiada, like Paul, like Barnabas did with Mark, and like Jesus did with the Twelve. You know, it's, it's, it's natural for, for when people grow up, they want to have children. That's pretty natural. 
It's the rare couple that get married that don't want to have children. Why is that? It's just how life is. It's natural for us to, to grow up and want to be parents. It should be natural for us to grow up spiritually and want to be parents. To have children, to be spiritual parents. Parents have dreams for their children. You know, often we think, well, man, I want them to grow up and get educated so they can have a good job and provide for their families and have a nice home and drive a nice car. But all those things are just garbage. No. But the day the Lord takes me home, when they put me in some casket or in an urn or whatever they do, the only thing that will matter is whether I was faithful and I had a good influence on those around me and my children are faithful. All the other stuff just won't matter at all. Parents have dreams for their children. Spiritual parents have dreams for their children. Uh, parents work and sacrifice to keep their children, to help their ch children achieve those dreams. And so spiritual parents work and sacrifice to help their spiritual children reach those dreams. Um, so I'd like to close by just I don't expect you to answer this, but I, I'd like for you to think about who are your spiritual children? It's never too late to have one. There is no such thing as spiritual menopause. Um, I don't, the Lord doesn't need people that are talented. He just needs people that are faithful. The church has way over preached the idea of talent. What we need is people that believe that the Lord can use them. Years ago, when I was, I think I was 22, I just got out of college and and uh, when I was a teenager when church was over I went to the car and waited for mom to stop talking uh, I was kind of like my dad I was pretty quiet and uh, in a certain way I was just kind of afraid of people you know uh, we Kathy and I got married and we had uh, one child and uh, we moved to Central California and I worked on a ranch and and one of the deacons came by our house and, and brought us some groceries the first week. And we were grateful for that, you know. And uh, he says, well, Mike, he was from Oklahoma. He, he says, well, for Mike, I'm gonna, I, on Tuesdays, I go visit people. I'll come by and you can go with me next week. And I was too scared to say no. His name was Bill A. June. He was from... Somewhere in eastern Oklahoma, had been raised up in the coal mines and was an uneducated man. But he knew more scripture than most people. But Bill would go visit in those days. It was, this was in the 1970s. We, we could go visit people in central California without an appointment. You just knock on their door, and if they were not busy, they let you in. And uh, so we'd go visit people that had been sick or uh, just moved to town or, or hadn't been coming to services. And, and so I tagged along with Bill for a while and, and uh, we'd knock on people's doors and we'd go sit on the couch and Bill was a lot different than me. He could just talk to anybody, didn't matter. I mean, he could talk to a wooden Indian and he'd keep the conversation going. And uh, we did this for a few weeks and, and uh, we were talking a while and and finally, we were sitting in this living room. He just shut up and he just did this. Mike, it's your turn. Scared me to death. 
But if it hadn't been for Bill forcing me to, to learn to, to put myself out there and, and to be more friendly with people, who knows where, how it turned out. Might not have been worth anything. I'm, I'm eternally grateful for Bill and, and the push that he gave me to grow. And there, it may not be exactly like that for you or for the people that you can have influence on, but I'm absolutely convinced the Lord has put someone in front of you that you can love and nurture and pull them closer to Jesus than they are today. And with that, I'll quit. Thanks for your attention. And don't you want to go to your grave hoping that somebody will think of you in the same way? <laughs>